Good afternoon, everyone. It's just so wonderful to see you all here today. This is a multi-generational group, and I know that we also have our guests joining us through the live stream, and I'd like to welcome them as well. We're here today to remember and celebrate the extraordinary life of our colleague, Daniel I.C. Wong. He was the Institute Professor of Chemical Engineering and a true friend, mentor, and colleague. I want to begin by giving a special welcome to Danny's wife, Victoria, and her son, Keith, as well as his family members who are present. Over the course of the next two days, you'll be hearing from alumni and colleagues about Danny's monumental impact as both a scholar and a mentor. It was a profound privilege to have him as a member of our community, and we thank you, Danny's family, for sharing him with us over all of these years. I'll keep my remarks relatively brief since we have a full slate of speakers this afternoon who have some wonderful stories to share about Danny. Danny leaves behind him a towering legacy in the field of biochemical engineering, and indeed, he's widely acknowledged as one of the founding fathers of the discipline. His groundbreaking research in the areas of bioprocessing, enzyme technology, and mammalian cell culture set the stage for our modern biotechnology industry and for many of the advanced pharmaceuticals that are saving lives today. His work was an example of the highest and best aspirations of engineers, and we are all the better for it. Danny was a member of the MIT family for more than 65 years, first coming here to do his undergraduate studies in 1955. He then went on to do his PhD at Penn under Art Humphrey, who you'll be hearing from shortly, and did two years of service in the Army before returning to MIT as a faculty member in 1965 in the Department of Food and Nutrition Science. In the early 80s, Danny officially joined the Department of Chemical Engineering, pushing the department further into the field of biochemical engineering. This led to the establishment of courses and training in the department that were, cent that were central to bioreactor design. Here was formed the foundation of metabolic engineering and ultimately the synthetic biology field. Danny also played a formative role in the American Institute of Chemical Engineers Society for Biological Engineering. We have been truly honored to count him in our ranks over the last 40 years. Danny was the driving force behind the formation of MIT's Biotechnology Process Engineering Center, known as BPEC. And I think a number of you here have good memories of BPEC and remember its formation. It brought together engineers and scientists from across the disciplines to advance this technology and he acted as its director from 1985 to 1998. Early problems with making recombinant proteins using E. coli demonstrated the need to use animal cells as a manufacturing method. And the platform that Danny began developing in the late 60s became the platform for manufacturing that uh, formed many of our important biologics in use today. In the 80s, Danny's lab became a powerhouse of innovations in this field solving critical problems in improving cell cultivation and microcarrier technology, growth medium design, process monitoring, and bioreactor design. Danny always had an uncanny ability to see the big picture of where the field was going. And the impacts of his research are found in every sector of biotech and the pharmaceutical fields today. He was named Institute Professor in 1995. In recognition of these contributions, he was also elected to the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But we more than just remember Danny as a brilliant scholar, we also remember him as an inspired and engaging teacher and mentor. Danny was a born storyteller, conveying his vast knowledge with a passion and creativity that stuck with his students. Over the course of this symposium, we'll, we'll hear from many of his students sharing their memories of him and his impact on their lives. Seeing so many of you in the room is truly touching and speaks to his profound gifts as a teacher. I personally will always remember Danny as a faculty mentor. He was actually one of my assigned faculty mentors when I first started here as a faculty member in 1995. And I got to experience for myself his kindness, his humor, and his go to it uh, <laughs> uh, in encouraging me to, to move it and to uh, reach for the dreams that I had. He was just an amazing person and perhaps the most incredible champion for the people that he mentored. I miss Danny Wong, my colleague and friend, but I join all of you in feeling profound gratitude 
that he chose to make MIT his home over all these years. With that, I'd like to invite my colleague Charlie Cooney up to the stage. Charlie is well known to most of you as one of Danny's earliest students and as a longtime member of our faculty and a leader in the field. He'll be sharing his own reflections tomorrow, but this afternoon he has graciously offered to serve as MC, seeing as how he was on most of your thesis committees. <laughs> and with that, I turn things over to Charlie. Thank you, Paula. Uh, putting the, uh, uh, the program together uh, was a uh, fascinating journey uh, for, for, for many. Um, and the, but it's, it's the journey that, um, uh, that many of you in this room uh, have uh, participated in and are a part of uh, that we're really uh, commemorating as we, as we think about the legacy uh, that, that Dan leaves uh, uh, behind. Uh, it's important to remember that, uh, yes, we are here to, uh, uh, to share our memories uh, and to celebrate uh, all that Dan has, has done for us. But one of the things that's very important, as, uh, as each of the uh, participants this afternoon speak, uh, you're his legacy. So have you done good? <laughs> uh, I've, have you finally answered the question, so what? And why does it matter? And have you thought of? We'll see. Um, now, in order to begin the program, um, we, we wanted to have a, a special guest, who um, uh, Art Humphrey, uh, who was Dan's mentor. Uh, and and I, I actually overlapped. Well, I didn't overlap with Dan at Penn, um, but Art was also my first mentor as an undergraduate chemical engineer. Um, but I, I, I had the, the privilege of uh, recording a conversation with him, and I believe that Art is actually going to listen to what he said, which he doesn't usually do. Um, th sorry, Art. Um, uh, through the live stream. Um, but this conversation was an opportunity to uh, ask some of the questions that many of us have wanted to ask. Dan, how did you really get here? Were you a good student? <laughs> Were you able to deliver uh, in the same way that you have demanded of us? <laughs> well, we will hear it from the proverbial um, mentor's mouth uh, in this short video uh, that we'll introduce right now. Uh, Art Humphrey is uh, a Dean Emeritus of Engineering and Applied Science from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, from that, he went on to be provost of Lehigh University for a number of years. Uh, and is retired with his wife, Sheila, uh, and they live in uh, Maine at the, at the present time. So with that, um, let's turn the video on and uh, see if uh, some of those questions that we would like to have asked um, are, are answered in this introduction. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and up, up on the screen, you'll see a picture. This is actually a picture of Danny and Vicki uh, from John and Ann Onan's wedding. And it's just one I had in my scrapbook and I wanted to pull it out. I didn't have slides for the presentation, but I just thought having that smile uh, overlooking us while we uh, uh, talk today for the next few minutes would be fun. It just gives the sense that something good is happening in Danny's flock. Uh, so I'm happy to show it. Um, and although we didn't just hear from Professor Humphrey, um, it's really an honor to be on the same program uh, with him. Uh, he was obviously Danny's mentor, uh, and, and pretty much everyone in this room uh, looks at Danny as a mentor, and so if Danny's the father of, of an industry, Professor Humphrey is the grandfather, and we all owe him a debt of gratitude as well. Uh, Paula, it's wonderful to see you. We were both class of 84, uh, chemical engineering at MIT. Um, there was that day when we took a test, and the class average was 26 out of 100. Uh, a story I still tell, if we could both fast forward then, know where we were today, I think we'd feel a lot better than we felt that day. Uh, but thank you for hosting and for your leadership of the department. Uh, and for many of you in the audience, it's just wonderful to see you again. Um, the last time I think we saw a lot of each other in person was Danny's 70th birthday in 2006. Uh, what John colloquially referred to, John Onans referred to as the Wonga Palooza. 
really everybody coming back, and what a great reunion that was uh, with a phenomenal list of speakers as we have today. Now, if we look at the speakers uh, uh, today, we see so many people have gone on to become leaders in the biotech process and engineering industry or academia, and I'm not one of them, but you'll hear from them shortly. So Danny was a legend, and you're gonna be hearing about how he mentored students and, and really made a difference in their, in their lives. Uh, he was a phenomenal thesis advisor, and he taught me a lot about solving problems. But he also showed what could happen when you combine high standards, intellectual rigor, important problems, and a big heart. For my remarks today, I want to share three things that I learned from Danny, and then share three quick stories about him. First, strategically, Danny showed me the benefit of working on important problems. These are things that if they're solved, they're going to make a difference in the world, make the world a better place. I always found there was great energy in the types of problems that, that he led us to work on. If they were easy, they would have been solved already. So sure, they were hard. But because they were going to make a big difference, that was a real driving force. And it seemed all of Danny's students were working on important problems. So when we got together at the different lectures, you could, you could say, hey, this, this, this place, this lab, this department is making a huge difference. So I'd say Danny first showed me that the, one of the ways to make a difference in the world was to work on important problems. Second, it's much more tactical. And Paula referred to some of these things already. But Danny taught me a lesson about planning versus doing. I started off a bit as, as, as an over planner. I was trying to plan my research and my master's thesis and, and you know, was trying to put all these different things together. And one day, Danny just stopped me and he said, OK, you got to get your hands wet. You don't have a clue what you need to be planning until you start trying to do experiments. You don't know what machinery is not going to work. You don't know what sensors aren't going to work. You don't have a clue how to plan your thing until you start. So just dive in and do it. In a way, it was Yoda-like. You know, Yoda once said, do or do not, there is no try. But Danny could have one-upped it with, one must try before one can do. <laughs> Third, like any good engineer, even the most complex problems should be broken down into more bite-sized problems. And Danny showed us all how to do that. In my case, he guided me to an interest, really interesting topic um, for a master's thesis, which is the scale up of animal cell culture cells using microcarriers in fermenters. And you had to design that as you were designing the scale up. Getting oxygen to them, which was the rate limiting uh, nutrient, was going to be more and more of a problem. And so we picked this project. And fundamentally, it's a project about mass transfer, getting oxygen to these cells. Now, I don't know that Danny knew that the only C I ever got was in 10302 as an undergraduate, which was mass transfer. But in classic MIT style, you just stick your nose in it and plow away and take those complex problems, chop them up, and chew through them. Nothing's too daunting if you can approach it that way. Now, I'd like to share a few Danny stories. Danny was wonderfully direct. And as I started writing my thesis, he pulled me aside and he said, OK, what are you going to do next? And it was running through my mind. I was like, you know, is he, is he trying to use my RA for another student and hinting that I should be getting out of the way? Uh, but no, he was really planning the next step of, of help. And, and I told him that I was quite interested in combining business with science and technology. It was something my dad had done for his career. And, and someday I thought I might like to run a a life sciences firm, which was kind of the new industry at the time. So I thought an entry-level job in pharmaceutical product development or maybe working for a management consulting firm would be the, the place I wanted to head to. Danny stopped me right there. He said, before you do anything, I want you to meet somebody. And he, he told me about a friend, Moshe Alafi. Moshe was a venture capitalist, and Danny knew him from the Biogen board. Danny said, you know, you might want to talk to Moshe. I think you're going to find what he does interesting. Give him a call, which, of course, is how we actually communicated with people back in 1986. So I was a graduate student with a car. Moshe was a Biogen board member who needed a ride to the airport. It was a match made in heaven. 
So I picked him up and brought him to Logan, and somewhere in the Callahan Tunnel is when I first learned about venture capital. Now, it's 1986, I'm at MIT, I'm interested in business, but I had never heard of it. It was really a cottage industry back then, and none of my friends had heard of it either. But thanks to Danny, he set up this meeting with Moshe, and I was able to learn about this new industry and how it works, and, and an opportunity to have a career that would bridge business and science. Moshe gave me a list of every firm in the industry. It wasn't that many at the time, and I wrote them all with letters and stamps, because that's how you did things back then. And I only got one response, but that's the job I've had for 35 years, and I can trace it all to my conversation with Danny. So Danny's interest was in the success of his students, regardless of where they ended up going. In my case, it was this weirdly different path. But he not only gave me the idea, he set up the first steps in motion. And for me, it was one of those key moments more in my life. I said, boy, if this had happened a little bit differently, I could have had a very different life. And so I owe a lot of gratitude to Danny. Second story, you know, Danny's a legend in his, his accomplishments in bioengineering. But equally, he should have a legend reputation for caring for others. And I want to share a story about that. In 2008, as part of a 25th reunion gift, my wife and I uh, asked Danny to help us designate some, some money to MIT. We were kind of inspired by the MacArthur Genius Grants, where money's just given to really smart people and they'll figure out what to do with it. And so we asked Danny to think about what he thought needed to be funded at MIT and wasn't otherwise getting done. And Danny shared that he had become very concerned about the problem of work-life balance at MIT. He was concerned about the stresses at work and home together on young faculty and how it manifested in divorce rates that were trending way too high. And he was prescient in his concern that the additional stresses of work-life balance were disproportionately being borne by female faculty. Recognizing the societal pressures, he wrote in an email to the MIT administration regarding how he wanted the money spent, quote, I'm very sympathetic to our young junior faculty members, having mentored three young junior female faculty members in our department. I do not think men such as myself have any idea what these women have to contend with in their home lives, especially having children, and at the same time, devote the commitments at the workplace. So Danny's designation got MIT's attention. He designated the funds to MIT Center for Work, Family, and Personal Life to create a website to serve as an informational portal for M MIT faculty with fam family responsibilities. The website still exists today. It's at hr.mit.edu slash worklife. And it's a gateway to many resources MIT's made available to meeting the personal and professional needs of faculty, staff, postdocs, grad students, and their families. Now, it's reasonable to assume that a high-powered institute professor focused on work-life balance advanced the cause at MIT. And I think as Danny's efforts accelerated the progress that were foundational to today's programs, like the MIT Center for Work, Life, and Well-Being, and the Mind, Hand, and Heart program, two very important programs uh, for work-life balance issues today. The last story I want to share is about the Daniel I.C. Wong professorship. Many of you know Newbar in our audience today, Newbar a fan. And over the years, Newbar and I would see each other at MIT events, and Newbar would often say, you know, we really should do something to honor Danny. And he mentioned the professorship as something aspirational, but the top of his list. And we'd see each other around town at different events, MIT, philanthropic events and otherwise, and we'd rekindle the same conversation. Well, I serve on the MIT Corporation Development Committee, so I got a heads up in 2014 that in the next few months, the whole ground rules for a professorship were about to change. So I contacted Newbar, and I said, hey, you know, you've been thinking about endowing this professorship, you know, maybe this would be a good time. And he said, you're right, now is a good time. Let's split it. <laughs> well, it was a great idea, but there was a big challenge. MIT had never named a professorship for a professor living and serving on the MIT faculty. Newbar did a phenomenal job, along with Brad Smith and resource development, to convince the powers that be that Danny wasn't going to be serving in the chair, it was just named after him. And someone else would be there. And it seems silly 
to have to wait for somebody to pass away before we could honor them with a deserved chair. Now, Danny was already an institute professor. He founded BPEC. He pretty much invented an industry. He wrote the book. But an endowed chair lives forever. And one of my favorite moments was visiting Danny and Vicky at their house with Newbar, where we told them about the creation of the Daniel I.C. Wong professorship. It was really special. Now, I know Danny considered as his primary honor really something else, which is the success that you all have achieved as leaders in academia and industry and making the world a better place. I know that's what really drove him. But when we shared with him what his friends and colleagues and mentees had done, naming a chair in his honor, it made a huge impression on him. So thank you for letting me share some thoughts and anecdotes about Danny. I'm incredibly grateful for what he's done for me, and I think you're going to hear a lot about that in the next day and a half. So next, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is a video. It's my dad, as Charlie mentioned. Uh, Art Goldstein, uh, who ran a membrane purification company in Watertown, Mass, called Ionics Incorporated, was uh, known for water desalination, but also took the same processes uh, to apply them to biologicals. And he worked on several projects with Danny over that, and uh, Danny served on the board. And you're going to hear more about that in the video. I should also mention it was my dad who introduced me to Danny in the early 80s. So I'm very grateful for that, too. And as Charlie said, it's a generational thing with us, uh, but please take a look at the video. Thank you very much. I know Danny was a great mentor and advisor to Jono, and I'm pleased to have the chance to share my views from the perspective of my own long relationship with Danny. For me, it was a privilege to work with Danny Wong. I'm very proud that for many years he was a dear friend, a fellow board member, and a reliable advisor. I should also say I'm very proud that Danny, like many of Ionix founders, employees, and board members, came to Ionix from MIT. These folks helped and encouraged us to pioneer the research and development of membranes and related technology, as well as the engineering equipment and operating systems for worldwide use in desalination, water purification, food processing, and a wide variety of other applications. My Danny Wong story began in the early 80s when I was introduced by Sam Goldsmith. Sam was then the head of MIT's Nutrition and Food Science Department and a long-term member of our board of directors. Sam shared our interest in developing membrane-based cheese whey demineralization systems to serve the rapidly growing market for infant formula. Danny developed a relationship with us based on our common interest in membrane-based biochemical separations. When Danny told us he was planning to retire from the board, it was clear that Danny was the perfect person to fill that slot. It was love at first sight with Danny. He was a very engaged Ionix board member. He quickly became highly appreciated for his dry sense of humor his insightful advice to our board and our management team, and his thoughtful wisdom relating to technology developments, potential acquisitions, and market opportunities. Danny served as a member of the board until 2005, when Ionix was acquired by GE. Vita and I had a wonderful personal relationship with Danny, Vicky, and Keith. After Danny became an institute professor at MIT, we were invited to an enormous celebration at a very memorable, very scrumptious banquet at a very large downtown Chinese restaurant. Danny and Vicky later invited us to a private dinner at their home to savor a Peking duck feast prepared entirely by them. 
They even showed us how the finished product was blow dried in their basement, just as any highly imaginative, capable chemical engineer would do. More recently, we were involved in other activities, including those related to the Daniel I.C. Wong Chair at MIT. It was an enormous blessing and a very special pleasure for us to know Danny and his family. That, that was terrific. I, I believe we have uh, Art Humphrey about to emerge uh, on the uh, on this on the screen. It's my pleasure to be here today with uh, a longtime friend and colleague, uh, both of, of Dan's and, and myself, and that's uh, that's Art Humphrey, uh, and. This will be an opportunity, uh, even though he's not able to join us physically at the at the conference today. Uh, this is an opportunity to hear some of the interesting stories uh, about uh, Dan and and how he um, began his very distinguished journey in, into biochemical engineering. But before we embark on that part of the conversation, uh, I, I would like to uh, introduce a dear friend, uh, Art Humphrey. Um, Art did his uh, PhD with Elmer Gayden at Columbia, and my recollection is that he was uh, Elmer's first PhD student. Uh, and then uh, following that, about 1953, I believe, uh, Art went to University of Pennsylvania uh, as a, a new faculty member in biochemical engineering in the chemical engineering department uh, and began what was a, a very distinguished career at a very pivotal time in the history of biochemical engineering. Uh, he really um, helped define uh, what it was to educate a biochemical engineer uh, in those, those early days. He went on to become the department head of chemical engineering at Penn uh, and then dean, uh, and went on uh, after that to be provost of Lehigh University before he retired uh, let's just say a couple of years ago. Um, Art, you, you knew more uh, about Dan's early history uh, and his early journey that, that led to his, his uh, beginnings of his career at MIT and Penn than probably anybody else uh, today. Um, and, and as I recall, um, that story begins with a passion for baseball. Uh, and uh, maybe you can share with us your insights into how Dan's passion for baseball uh, became transformed into uh, a beginning career at MIT, and not only MIT, but in the ROTC. Dan lived in Washington, D.C., where his father was associated with the Chinese embassy, and he was a very bright student, but he loved baseball, and he wanted to be a... Uh, a shortstop on a professional baseball team. But his father said he needed to utilize his many uh, right talents and that he should go to MIT. And he got a uh, ROTC fellowship uh, to go to MIT and uh, proceeded uh, to study and get a degree from MIT and uh, graduate with a second lieutenant uh, uh, appointment in the army. But he applied for a two-year uh, extension before he had to report. And it was during that time he was trying to find the best way to get the most educational uh, background that he could. And so Dan called me and said, could he get a PhD from me in two years? And I told him, well, uh, you're not working on uh, uh, media sterilization. And yes, I had a project to get the kinetics of Clostridium thermophilus, uh, which was considered one of the most uh, common spore forming microorganisms in uh, media for fermentation. And so he worked on that, built a machine, uh, a flow machine to get the, the kinetics, 
and uh, got a, a, a PhD uh, in two years in the summer of uh, uh, 1962. Um, Art, when, uh, when, when Dan uh, came to your laboratory uh, in uh, 1960, which is, I believe, when he finished at MIT, um, uh, you had a project on media sterilization. And I thought that was particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, as I recall, you did your PhD with Elmer on air sterilization. And when we think of the bioprocess industry, at that point in time, in the early 60s, um, air and media sterilization, these were, these were really critical areas to the industry. Uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about how uh, you, you initiated this project on media sterilization at what I believe to be a very critical time uh, in scale up uh, of uh, industrial fermentation? Well, it was generally known uh, by uh, 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 people at MIT that, that the kinetics uh, of uh, a spore organism that was uh, much more sensitive to temperature than of the normal media components in uh, your fermentation media. And that uh, uh, flow sterilization or flash sterilization that was known uh, and uh, could be a continuous process where you could kill the, the uh, microorganisms, uh, the, uh, particularly the spore formers, and with less harm to the key nutrients of the media. And uh, so that was quite important step and that uh, we needed the good kinetic data which came out of Dan's thesis. Well, that's a, a very interesting story for a number of reasons. One is of course, it's been very important to the industry and high temperature, short time sterilization uh, is, is central to many processes today. Uh, that's maybe, right. But also, um, it, it strikes me that this is, an, uh, this is a time in Dan's formative educational career um, that he was beginning to address uh, industrially relevant and important problems, but bringing the fundamentals of chemical engineering to solving those problems. Uh, was, was this the intent when, um, when you first uh, began this project to, uh, to, to really bring chemical engineering science to industrial processing? Yes, our, our long-term view was that things would ultimately go to continuous fermentation and that uh, uh, solving the uh, air sterilization and media sterilization is to making that possible. And that Dan's research was a, a step in media sterilization. Well, then it's interesting uh, that in, after only two years, uh, he was able to finish his, uh, his PhD thesis. Uh, I, know, I know many students who, uh, many, many students who would aspire uh, to, to that uh, time frame. Uh, and then he went, went into this interesting, let me call it postdoctoral position. Um, and perhaps you can uh, tell us more about how, how Dan, one, was able to finish a PhD thesis in two years, uh, must have been a hardworking student, which is not a surprise. But um, how did he then go on to uh, his career in the military? Well, um, uh, Dan said to me when I said, do you think that do this in two years? This means working summers, uh, weekends, holidays, and he said, I can do that. There was nothing that he wasn't afraid to tackle. I can do that was his philosophy. How did it work uh, that, um, that Dan would then spend, I believe it was three years uh, in the, well, he had three years of military duty, I suspect. Um, and uh, he went to Fort Detrick, I believe? Yes, well, the, the problems in the Fort Detrick was uh, 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 bioprocessing safety, uh, uh, bioprocessing media and air sterilization, and uh, biological containment. And uh, Dan had the right attitude 
and he was superb at that. He really, really was uh, looked up to by all of the people, and uh, particularly the, the uh, non-military employees, as uh, a, a teacher and an advisor. Well, it, 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 it was an interesting, uh, again, time in history because that experience uh, and uh, the understanding he brought of, of sterilization to, to safety was important. But um, uh, my recollection is that he also had an introduction into the challenges of scale up uh, and even animal cell culture that became so important to, um, uh, to not only the industry, but certainly uh, Dan's contributions uh, to what we now know as the biotech industry. Oh, well, I was going to say that probably a key exposure there was the fact that uh, uh, Fort Dietrich was working or trying to work with mammalian cell culture and, and bioprocessing. And that's where Dan probably got his initial start in that and uh, uh, led him to his many fabulous contributions to that area of mammalian cell bioprocessing. Now, I, I, when I went to Penn, I arrived as an undergraduate in 1962, and that's when, when Dan was leaving. So I missed him there, and I think it was 1965 that he arrived at MIT. Yes. Um, so I finally got to meet him um, uh, in um, late 1965, uh, and I went to started my journey at MIT in 1966 um, because the, the the department was course 20. It was the Department of Nutrition and Food Science. Uh, the biochemical engineering program was a collaboration between chemical engineering, biology, and nutrition and food science. Uh, Cecil Dunn, a very well-known industrial microbiologist, and Dick Matalus was still a, an early faculty member there. Um, so it, it was an exciting time to get started. And I, I guess my part of the story is that uh, it enabled me to be uh, uh, Dan's first PhD student. Um, but the part I wanted to pick up on is that um, we then began to share uh, a journey of teaching. I, I had learned by chemical engineering from you when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Dan learned it with you uh, as a graduate student. Uh, and then here we were, 19, late 1960s, you, Dan, eventually myself, and others began teaching. Um, what is the story of this course that we were teaching together called fermentation technology? Yeah, well, fermentation and enzyme technology. Uh, but. Uh... Uh, uh, Dick Manley started it, but uh, he, he didn't continue it, and it was left to Dan to pick it up. And Dan started it to take care of it continuously from, I think, 1967 until he retired. But that course is still being run. But the, the important thing, uh, and uh, to Dan's credit, was that he gathered the people together and they uh, produced uh, this book. Uh, which is uh, uh, fermentation and enzyme uh, uh, technology. But uh, it's uh, by Daniel C. Wong. And uh, he gathered the people together in this course, which the course involved, evolved to uh, become uh, taught all over the world. And uh, uh, that gave Dan truly uh, his first significant reputation as the premier bioprocessing engineer in the world. Well, certainly one of the, the privileges uh, that I felt as a young faculty member, uh, when I started teaching in the courts, which I think was 1970, um, what, a, what a treat to, uh, to be able to teach with your, uh, your mentors. Um, for, for, for you, for Dan, myself, um, uh, Arnie Domain, who had joined the, the faculty at, at that time. Now, in closing, Art, um, how would you describe um, uh, the, uh, the impact, in a few words, uh, that Dan has had uh, on the field of biochemical engineering? 
worldwide impact and everybody has looked up to him as the leader during the, that period of bioprocess engineering. All right, this has been a real privilege to, to have a chance to uh, have this conversation with you. Uh, the, the many things that uh, all of you uh, as former students uh, experienced, um, where those roots came from. Uh, and how some of that early uh, education shaped Dan's thinking uh, and how he translated that to uh, the benefit of, of all of us. Uh, the, the next uh, set of comments are from Matt Krogan. Um, Matt was a, a PhD student in the, uh, the heady uh, BPEC years, um, went on to one of the early stage uh, companies, Genentech, uh, and um, many contributions there and since. So, Matt, please. All right, so our first slide. Um, Danny liked to play poker, and you can notice a few things from this slide. First, in front of Danny, there's a lot of chips. In front of me, I'm the one taking the photo, there's a reasonable number. In front of Brian, there's none. And in fact, Brian brought that whole bag full of chips so he could you know, last through the evening. But in reality, actually, Brian's an excellent poker player, and uh, that was actually a gift for Danny. But uh, part of the reason Danny was, and actually Brian's one of the few people that could go toe to toe with Danny, and he was an excellent poker player because he read individuals. He didn't see poker as a simple statistical game, but he would figure out if you were a bluffer or you were very conservative and he might fold or raise or call depending on what your personality was like. And that was the same way he, he handled his grad students as he had adjusted how he handled every grad student. So some of us only met with him every three or four months, other ones he met with weekly. Might be a little harsh with some, less harsh with others. It was a customized graduate advisor for that. And, um, you know, to join the MIT family or the Wong family, you didn't have to play poker or tennis. That did help. But you could also be a MIT undergrad. And so I would say uh, Bernard Trout is a member, you know, MIT undergrad, worked with Mike Thien, went to Cal, came back here as a faculty member. And another one, uh, go to the next slide is Amanda Lewis, who's in the audience here. And um, she was an MIT undergrad, graduated here about 2007, eight, okay, and then went to work for Hal Alper at UT Austin, another member of our family. And of course, once you join the family, you get all the rights and privileges, including you get your older brother, Matt, to teach you how to mountain bike. So uh, Amanda picked that up very quickly. And, um, We'll go to the next slide. So I'm actually a member of a few different biotech families. Um, my original biotech family is actually at Berkeley where I went undergrad. And um, I was actually recruited into biotechnology by Francis Arnold, the uh, 2018 uh, Nobel Prize winner. And so here we are at Cal at a bar nearby celebrating her Nobel Prize. And you see me and Francis, Francis's son, uh, Harvey Blanche, sort of Danny's competitor in the top world of biochemical engineering, and Doug Clark to the dean and another top biochemical engineer. And um, while I was at Cal, you know, everyone said, well, you should go to grad school at MIT and study with Wong and Cooney. And so I applied and then I got in and Danny called my fraternity 7 a.m. on a Saturday and uh, the phone rang about 25 times until a pledge very reluctantly answered it. Pounded on my door, hey, Augie, there's some guy from MIT that wants to talk to you. And uh, that was Danny convincing me to come to MIT. And then he called my mom, and that was a conversation between a Chinese tiger dad and an Irish tiger mom. And I can tell you how that conversation went with, which was go challenge that boy. And that, that defined my relationship with Danny for the rest of my life, uh, sort of like my relationship with my mother a little bit. And uh, 
and that went on forevermore, which was great. And um, yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Oh, so this, Francis uh, was invited by MIT to come give the Hoyt Hoddle lecture, and you guys are so kind, you allowed me to connect in through linked, uh, LinkedIn. And uh, this is what Francis said in response to a question from some of the students uh, about what career advice. And, the, and she said, I tried a lot of things that didn't work. I learned things that I didn't think I would use, but then was able to recombine them later on. Um, so my only advice is to collect knowledge like it is money in the bank, collect that knowledge, be flexible, and maybe you can recombine it. And this, of course, I was, is really my philosophy in life. I've never seen it stated quite so clearly. I think it was Danny's philosophy, too. He often recombined things in very unique ways, and he'd sort of collect knowledge like it was money in the bank. So, um, and to sort of, I like to think of Danny as a, what I call an off-piste engineer. Neil will understand what that means. And um, so to explain that, go to the next slide. So this is called the Chutes. It's, we're near Lake Tahoe here. This is up the hill from my house. And these are a bunch of double black diamond ski runs. And in about, I took this shot earlier this week and in about a month or two, this will be filled in with fresh powder. And Neil will probably come out and we'll hit that and ski all the cleared trails there until the powder's cleared. And then we'll jump into the trees and ski the steep stuff through the trees, which is slightly insane, but we're powder nuts and that's what we do. And, um, and I want to explain that this is really how Danny approached things too, is he didn't actually stay on the marked trails. He'd go through the steep stuff through the trees, even though it's very challenging, but that was... Un, uncharted territory and something unique. It was recombining information and that was a, how Danny viewed the world. Um, so another one thing I want to point out about um, being a member of the Wong family, so not only could you not back off a challenge, but luckily you had Charlie Cooney as your older, el the eldest brother of the family. And, um, and I don't I think, honestly, that Danny would have been as successful as he was without Charlie. Um, Charlie's always been very supportive. Danny's very demanding. Charlie gives you lots of advice in your ear, lots of insights, um, always watching out for you, always has your back, always presents new opportunities. So I'd like to thank you for that, Charlie, and you're still playing the role today. And of course, here at MIT, you also get a lot of kindly aunts and uncles. And uh, so for me, that was Alan Hatton, Clark Colton, Harvey Lotus, Phil Sharp, um, Tony Sinsky, Arnie DeMaine. Um, and then, of course, I have some friends here with Linda, and, Linda Griffith and Doug Laufenberger, too, that came since. So um, all right. So. One issue with, uh, you'll notice here that this is a kind of a top level perspective of the shoots. And, and actually I start off my mornings and I take this point and I look with uh, binoculars to see where the best snow is. And it's a top level view of the hill to decide where you wanna go. And this, as we've heard, this was sort of Danny's view toward life was to look at things from a high level view and figure out what was the best direction, what was a new opportunity. And the problem at MIT is we're beavers here. And beavers are very good at walking around on the ground or diving underwater, which I, it's like fundamental knowledge or maybe technology uh, adaptation. But when you say, let's take a systems level view or look at new opportunities coming up, a beaver doesn't naturally do that. They don't naturally get that high level. And so Danny's challenge, I think, for many of us was to try to, for us to grow wings. So I'll have the next slide. And uh, this was our Flying Beaver Award for Eugene Schaefer, one of our classmates. And um, this was the idea that, you know, if you, Danny was successful with you, you could operate across all levels, from a high level to an intermediate level to a more fundamental level. And um, so we gave, Gene's a success story. We gave him this award in 2002. So that was a, a pretty neat thing. And so 
Let's go back, and I want to talk about how Danny used that vision to really have a dramatic impact on the world. And this goes back to 1980s. Um, and as Paula had mentioned, the E. coli couldn't be used to make everything. Cho cells had to be used or some similar type cell. And the productivities were very, very low. And the only thing you could make sort of economically viable was products like erythropoietin, which is a very low dose product, or TPA, which is a one-time use. And those, so those markets weren't gigantic. And everybody knew we wanted to make antibodies, but it was very clear the doses were sky high and the products, the productivity of these processes wasn't even close. So um, uh, there was a shortfall there and really Danny and Charlie recognized it and created BPEC partly to address that shortfall, did a lot of other things too. And I want to show you what happened as a result. And this was really a matter of recruiting and training a bunch of flying beavers and then sending them into this uh, field to address it. And so this is a graph. We got it, we're at MIT, we got to have one graph. It's a semi-log graph even, you know. And uh, so it's product concentration at harvest over years since 1980. And this is for making uh, recombinant therapeutic proteins from Cho cells. and. Um, I think some of you have seen a, a version of this data from me before, but this is a very select set. And this is basically the biotech industry's version of Moore's Law, right, where things double in the semiconductor industry every year and a half. For us, it's actually every 3.4 years. And I separated out the data as best I could um, where that process involved a key, a key person was a biochemical engineer from MIT. And I separated those from the ones where the MIT people, as far as I knew, weren't involved, or I at least didn't have any confirmation of their involvement. And you see the MIT ones are the, uh, the blue triangles. And what you'll notice is all the early leaders, right, when this field first kicked off are out of MIT, right? And I can, we have Jim Stramondo, Jim Leung's here, lots of other people played a key role in this. And, um, and so it doesn't look like, when you look at this 25-year graph, it doesn't look all that you know, impressive, but you realize that's a two to five year jump ahead of everybody else in the industry, right? Which is worth billions of dollars and worth many lives. Think of, of Herceptin being five years delayed to the clinic, right? Or Avastin later on, or, or Humira, right? Wouldn't be a product if you didn't jump into this realm where you're up near a thousand migs per liter or a gram per liter, it's at that point that they become economically viable and you can make money and serve the market. So I just wanted to point out that Danny and Charlie's early jump in this led the world two to five years ahead of everybody else and had a very dramatic impact. What you notice later on is uh, it seems like everybody can imitate us quite well, so there's no more <laughs> MIT advantage. So uh, we don't necessarily keep the lead forever, but we can often have a big impact by doing a, an early jump. So just finish off the talk there. Thanks. Matt, thanks a lot. And, you know, it, it uh, uh, it's, it's really interesting to reflect back on those very early days um, in the 1980s when biotechnology was first beginning to come together. Um, and uh, uh, BPEC um, was a, a primary source of the raw material, the people, uh, many of whom are in this room now, who went on to, uh, to work at Genentech um, and make major contributions. Uh, you're a data point up there, I know. Uh, and, uh, and Biogen, uh, and the, um, uh, those, those contributions uh, really have made a big difference. And when I said earlier that uh, uh, Dan's legacy is here in this room, it's embodied in you, uh, that's really true. And in the next set of comments, we're, we're going to hear yet another perspective on that. Uh, Wei Shu Hu. Uh, who also uh, came out of uh, MIT in those heady days of BPEC, um, but then went on to uh, become, like Dan, uh, an academic. 
uh, and has been at the University of Minnesota for, a, for, for well, Weisho, I, I believe you're, you're listening, let's just say a few years, uh, and has uh, had a very distinguished career there. But you're, you're going to hear from Weisho now uh, recorded. Unfortunately, he was not able to join us uh, in person uh, today. Uh, and uh, his perspective and memories uh, on, on those uh, early, heady days uh, in BPEC. Good afternoon. I'm Wei Xiu Hu from the University of Minnesota. I graduated um, in 1983 from Danny Wang's laboratory and have uh, been uh, in Minnesota since then. Today, we are here to celebrate uh, Danny's um, legacy. And for many of us, including myself, one of the most important legacy he, he has is uh, related to Chinese food, Chinese ration. So I have uh, a few stories to tell about uh, Danny, about our experience together in the Chinese region. So uh, Danny and I had uh, one of our first trip to China in 1985. And we were going to go separately through Tokyo and meet up in Shanghai. And about a week before the, um, the trip, he sent me a letter all typed up with the instruction on how to where, how and where to get a, um, ramen noodle soup in Tokyo airport with the instruction, find the gate 45 and there stay, stairway upstairs and then go to the um, east corner of the uh, resting area. There's a noodle shop, simple, good and inexpensive. All right, and that's Danny. He always remembers to take care of his people, even though he's, he has always been very busy. All right, and he likes relatively simple stuff. All right, and when I left MIT, he was, uh, he has moved to, from his Dingji office in building 16 to a more spacious office in Kemi building. And by the time I returned in the next couple of years, he moved again to building 20, that's even bigger office. So I would drop by to see him and he would ask me to join him for lunch. And the lunch was simple. He didn't have a chef to cook for him in the office, not like other executives, but he had a good collection of instant, instant Chinese ramen noodles. And he point out to me, which ones for what, which ones for what. And we add in hot water and had a good meal together. All right, you know from Minnesota, what kind of Chinese restaurant we get here. So whenever I go to Boston and return home, my wife asks me what I had in Boston, what goodies I have in Boston. And I'll tell him, okay, I had an instant noodle with the Danny. So all around Danny is simple and um, um, simple and caring. All right, in 1983, in Washington, D.C., he and I both went, joined the um, AICH meeting in Washington, in Washington, D.C. All right, and then he always took time to take care of us and to advise us on the career or uh, any other matters. All right, so he told me he wanted to go to uh, a Chinese region to just talk to me about how do I start my career? How do I get the grants from the uh, from NSF and from other sources? All right, and he told me he knew the best restaurant in town. But he don't remember the name. He didn't remember the name of the restaurant. He remembered just vaguely where it was. And there was no Google back then, of course. So Yellow Page, you know, in DC, thick many, many pages of uh, Chinese restaurants. So he hopped in a cab, in a, in a cab. He told the cab driver to go to a certain area and there was a best restaurant in town, best Chinese restaurant in town. I wasn't even sure whether the um, driver has ever been to a Chinese restaurant, but he took us uh, somewhere anyway, dropped us off, and the, the restaurant looked nice. So we went in, and then he asked the person behind uh, the uh, reception desk uh, where the uh, best Chinese restaurant in town was. And we can, I was embarrassed about even the question he asked. And you can see the, uh, the person must have been the owner, was quite, um, quite upset. 
he raised his voice, told him, this is the best Chinese restaurant in town. So we went in anyway, we have no other choices. And it was a good meal. And importantly, then he had his fish head. Fish head, he didn't hear me wrong. Then he loves head of the fish, all right? But important to me in that meal, in that dinner was that we were discussing my starting my career and I told him I enjoy research most. I would have a uh, love to explore different, many different ideas. Then, then he told me, in the end, my most important product would be my student. And that always ingrained in my mind, all right? In our life, in the academic, well, the most important product we are going to produce were my students. So many of, the, many of us never heard of this from him directly, but in his heart, we are the most important, important product of him, all right? Um, and our venture into Chinese restaurant do not always end up good Chinese food. There was once he and I were in uh, Uppsala to attend uh, the recovery of our products conference organized by Charlie Cooney. Charlie Cooney started uh, that conference series at the beginning of our recombinant um, protein production era. All right, so he and I, as usual, in, and after a couple of days, he was sick of the food. We got to find some Chinese ration. But in the 19, early 1980s, in, in, the, um, in Uppsala, Sweden, you just don't expect to find a good Chinese ration. So we found one, and that's potentially uh, the only one in town. And the food was no good at all. This hot sour soup tasted like a made from the ketchup, all right, and the roast duck probably was uh, cooked a few days ago. Anyway, we had the Chinese food. And what was funny was the next day, then he wanted to go again, wanted to go again, all right? Because he couldn't stand the, uh, the uh, uh, conference food anymore. So he went again. After the, after the dinner, the sun was still up high, even though it was 8, 9 p.m. already, because it was Sweden back in, uh, in, in May, all right? So we went to his room to chat, chat about many, many different things for a long talk. And I told him about my ideas of starting a short course, training course for cell culture technology, like his fermentation technology course at MIT. And I also told him I wanted to start a engineering foundation conferences on cell culture engineering. All right, he supported my idea of starting a short course. But he said that's the best opportunity now and there was a huge industrial need to get into cell culture technology. And I was probably the best person to do it back then. But he told, he cautioned me, warned me again and again, not to start NGM Foundation Conference because he had seen how much work, how much energy Charlie Cooney put in to get that conference series going, how difficult it was. Or as he told me, if I, if I do that, Potentially, I could screw up my career and completely ruin my, ruin my future. So I should focus on my research, focus on setting my territory rather than diverting myself into two ventures. But he also told me, if I were going to start either or both of these um, show calls and uh, the uh, conference, I must keep MIT involved. He advised me not to include him in the team or in the organizer. All right, because he was my advisor. His joining was overshadowed on me. All right, I will be overshadowed by him. So he told him that wasn't good for my career, but I must somehow find MIT involvement in the, in the two ventures. And I took his advice to start Shell Culture Show Course, but I didn't listen to him about this NGM Foundation. I started my NGM Foundation conference on Shell Culture Engineering anyway. I also follow his advice to get MIT involved. So by the time we finished talking, the sun was up again. It was about 3 a.m. So I went to my went back to my room, took a nap, and next morning I changed my flights, my return flight to stop by Boston. And I went to Boston to invite Tom Lisinski to join the show course as well as be the co-chair of the NGO Foundation Company in Cell Culture Engineering. And that was a very good decision. That was a very important talk I have 
with him that affected my whole career, my whole career. The two company, the two, the show course as well, the company series of cell core changing are still going strong. 35 years after uh, we started. All right. Um, Danny is a very, very uh, valuable advisor. He tells me what I need to hear directly, bluntly, but for the good of me. All right. So in the, uh, in once we were in Sea Island, Georgia, for the for earlier recovery of our product companies for Charlie Queen. And again, he wanted to have Chinese food after two days. All right, but Sea Island out of nowhere. I would, we were sure, we weren't sure where to find the Chinese restaurant. So he said, well, then we can go to my go to his room to drink. But I wasn't good in drinking at all. I was no good, I'm still no good. So I wasn't a good partner. So I told him that um, I will need to find a public home, public phone to call home because my wife was pregnant and our second baby was support, was ex, was uh, expected to in about uh, a little bit over a month. And I saw Danny was visibly upset. He scolded at me, told me that I would never find another more important things than my family. My family will be the most important thing in my whole life. And I took that in heart. He said that directly to me, right? And for the good of me, all right? Danny is a giant, but for many of us, many of his students and mentees, he is a simple person, like simple Chinese food, and enjoy simple Chinese cuisines, all right? So in, the, in my last few visits to here to his house to see him, he would come, he would send me a list of uh, food to get from his favorite local restaurant. And we took them to his house and we had some simple Chinese food uh, together. All right, and of course that always includes Xiao Long Bao. All right. So we all have uh, fond memories of Danny and I know many of you have similar stories with Danny from other Chinese restaurants, from tennis court, or even from poker games and other parties. All right, he lives um, in our heart forever. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Keith and family. Thank you for sharing the gift with us that impact us for the whole life. Uh, and uh, there certainly are, all of us have our uh, uh, a set of uh, uh, Chinese food stories. Uh, more, more to come uh, with uh, fine cuisine. Uh, the, the next uh, set of comments are, 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 I'm really looking forward to, uh, as I am all of them, of course, but uh, Mike Thien uh, and Beth Dunker, um, uh, I believe met at MIT but certainly um, uh, they have uh, continued their, um, their journey together as, as husband and wife. Uh, and uh, we invited them to, to do a joint presentation. Now, I have no idea what uh, they're going to share with us. Um, however, having known Mike and known Beth uh, for, for many years, there is no doubt it will be interesting and fun, uh, and I welcome them to the stage in whatever is going to happen. <laughs> yep. Oh, look at that. So, um, hi, first of all, I'm Mike. You wanna say who you are? And I'm Beth. And, and I think Danny, if nothing else, would be amused by the fact that we're both here. Um, people have talked about a lot of the different aspects of Danny up till now, and, and I think it's become pretty clear that we all got a different part of Dan. 
right, in our experiences, whether it was in time or what it is we worked with, we all saw and felt something different. And of course, what we're going to talk about is, is no different. When we sat down and started writing, well, what would you like to talk about? Well, we had pages and pages that would take up many, many moons. But we, we finally decided that there were going to be four aspects of Dan that we're going to talk about. Now, I'm not going to go through what these are right now. You'll hear about them in just a minute. But four aspects that really came together for us. And one thing I'd, I'd like to point out is that while Dan had huge impacts on an industry, he also had huge impacts on us as individuals. And a lot of the behaviors Dan had laid a foundation for the way that we would act later in life. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the behaviors we experienced and the foundation they laid. Um, and the first one was innovation. Now, a lot of folks have spoken about Dan's bent on innovation and the fact that he had deep expertise but leapt fearlessly into new areas and did so successfully. So I, as opposed to belaboring that, I, I would rather talk about this piece that, you know, Jono talked about, the impactful problem. Uh, my experience was it was the hard problem. When I first went to Dan's office to say, hey, I'd like to do a thesis project with you, and of course, I didn't get a call. My mother didn't get a call either, Matt, so I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but when I went there, I, I said, what do you have? And he said, well, I have this project, I have this project, I have this project. And I kind of went, uh, do you have anything else? And, and he said, I have a problem. I was like, oh, what do you have? what's your problem? He said, well, these guys just came out with this stuff, NutraSweet made of aspartic acid and phenylalanine. And phenylalanine has not been a really big time selling amino acid until this. And now the demand is up tenfold, a hundredfold. The price has gone up 10 times what it normally is. And they can't make enough of this stuff. So, so we, the problem with this is the organism that makes it, it's inhibited by the production of phenylalanine. So you can't make a lot. So we, we got to be able to purify this away while we're fermenting it. Can you do that? And I said, that sounds like a really hard problem. Isn't the industry already working on this? And he said, we are here to do the hard problems. That's why we are here as, you know, why you're here as a graduate student at MIT. And, and we went on to work on this problem. And it wasn't until we actually started preparing for this talk that it occurred to me that I, I've used those words on many occasions, right? On a variety of different projects where we got to really hard parts and the team kind of looks at you and says, this is really, really hard. And, and, and I hear the words coming out of my mouth, we are here to solve the hard problems. And if we're not gonna take them on, why do they need us and who's gonna do it? And I think that that really carried forward from that initial discussion with Dan. And then of course, Dan was all about the unexpected application. Um, you know, if, if somebody else had invented something for a completely different industry or purpose, well, Dan was all about, well, why can't we use that? So, Beth's thesis was about the use of perfluorocarbons in fermentation because they had shown that you could put a, a rat in perfluorocarbon and it would still be able to breathe because perfluorocarbons can carry a lot of oxygen. So why not use this for fermentation, right? I, I, I had experienced uh, a technology called emulsion liquid membranes that were used for recovering silver from photoeffluent at Kodak. And I said, there's this kind of thing. He said, let's use that. He was just fearless. And I have to say that as we've gone on in our careers, there are pieces of equipment that are made for other industries that we say this is doing the same function and can do the same function for us. And I think the most recent example of that throughout the industry is manufacturing 4.0 and digitization, right? I, I have to say our experience is whenever we come up with a problem that we might want to solve with digital, it, it's been done in another industry. We just need to bring it in, that unexpected application, and use it. See here, come on, there we go. And one of my favorites, can you measure that online, right? Whenever you were doing something, Dan would say, well, why can't you measure that in situ? Why can't you just measure that by shoving it in the process and, and challenging us to do that? So this is Dan next to a fluorimeter that Dan wanted to see being used for fermentation. And I, again, one of those things that I kind of didn't imagine I would be echoing Dan, but I came to recognize after my first decade in the industry that when people came up with technology platforms, the platforms were incomplete if they only included the process. We needed the eyes of the process. We needed to have the analytics of the process. And I've constantly been pushing for people to put that 
in the process. And again, I think it goes back to Dan's challenges. And lastly, I think Dan had embraced the fact that if you're going to fearlessly go into new areas, if you're going to solve hard problems and use unexpected applications, that not all the innovations you come up with will end up being commercialized. Um, but as Francis Arnold said in, in the quote there, you know, that is coin in your pocket, and you're going to find another way to use those later. Shorter. Yeah, <laughs> maybe make this a little shorter. I'll stand on my toes and see how that works out. So um, both of us are actually very happy to be here. It's, it's really great to be here in person. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, in green button. the green button, the top yeah, one, right okay. about uh, taking these innovations and translating them to practical science and engineering. And the first part is really this idea of starting with that real problem that Mike talked about and working backwards. Um, you know, the book, which has been put up before, I really like that book. I love the book as a graduate student. I, I referenced it subsequently. It had data from real live applications. It had pictures, sometimes a little hard to decipher, but, but great pictures in it. It was really a, a, a fantastic book. And one of the things I liked about it was the real world application and the big problems. And I'll just tell a little bit of a story. Uh, Kozo Bawanyo, who hopefully is listening, and I were at Merck, and you know, we had a, a, a challenge, and the challenge was that uh, the people in the research area were screening uh, with using worms for antiparasitic com compounds to help with uh, river blindness and animal applications and such, and they needed these worms. And Kozo had a technician, who John also knew very well, who was doing this and at the five liter bubble column scale, because we, we were just assuming these worms were just, you know, really fragile. And this was just not making enough worms. And Kozo said, you know what? We have a big problem here. We need more worms. We need them quickly. We're just going to put them in a 200 liter tank. We're going to think about how we're going to set up the conditions. We're, we may get warm soup, but we actually got tons of worms. And it was just a really fantastic way of just thinking out of the box and, and making it happen. The second thing I wanted to talk about was doing it yourself. Um, in, the, in the 80s, there were DO probes just beginning to become commercially available, and every fermentation needed a DO probe. And they were kind of expensive, and, and it was expensive for a lab to just output every grad student with a couple DO probes. And there was a long history at MIT with making your own DO probes. In fact, it was a bit like a cult. Uh, and many people did this really, really well. I was not one of them. Jim McMillan, if you're listening, he, he just was a genius at it. And the way you had to do this was right away to the, the people at uh, um, 3M for a sample of their Teflon film. And then you had to not lose that film because you would make these up like every six months or so and uh, keep it there. And I actually still have mine because I just couldn't bear to throw it out for the last 35 years because that's how, how fresh it, it was. Now, the interesting thing about making DO probes was once you make something yourself, you really understand how it works, what's important about it. And that actually was very important to me. I became very uh, hands-on person, very interested in how things worked in equipment design and, and instrumentation design. We can't really have any of this go forward without talking a bit about BEAM seminars. And the thing that I came around with, uh, away with from BEAM seminars was the big picture thinking, the challenging results, the direct and openness of, of the questions. Now, the, the one picture there is a picture of the woman. Uh, there was an a ad campaign that Wendy's had in, around the 80s, where's the beef? And uh, Danny adopted that, that slogan really to get you think of what's the point, okay? What's the point of what you're trying to say? This actually helped me because, you know, a lot of uh, VPs and senior VPs aren't, aren't necessarily patient, and they want to get to the point quickly, and sometimes you never get past slide two or three, and if you're you know, taking a long time to get to your point, it doesn't, it doesn't work out very well. He also challenged results. Um, he would ask questions like, what, why is this important? And how do you know it's important? What does it mean? He would ask, uh, well, where's your missing data? Uh, and there would typically be gaps where maybe someone went home for a couple hours of sleep. And once that was kind of exposed, he really thought, you know, I better plan that experiment better or, or be in the lab. And again, he was always direct and open, um, which made, helped me greatly because I, I felt not totally f less fearful, but somewhat less fearful of, of questions after a talk. Then the last part about this is communication of results uh, really effectively. And 
Dan had a, a nice um, framework which he gave. Now you have to think back again to the 80s, the mid 80s. You didn't have the ability to make your PowerPoint slide deck up the night before and then switch it around when you realized you had too much stuff to say. You had to make these slides, which were physical slides. So you were stuck, you almost had a picture on a slide. And if you lost one or it was wrong, you were just stuck, you had to go with it. And so you had to really plan out your talk uh, in advance. And one of the things Dan would help you do, and this is Mike's uh, example here, uh, of planning out how, mu how much time each slide would really take, how much you would leave for the total time of the talk versus how much you were allotted. And boy, I wish more people would do that today because it doesn't actually happen. And as a result, um, it, we would also rehearse these talks and beam seminar, get really f good feedback, not only from the professors, but your colleagues as well. This resulted in repeated recognition for Danny's students. So we have here the, the Peterson Awards, which is a, an award um, from the ACS buyout division uh, over time. So in addition to the innovation, which Mike talked about, the practice, which I talked about, Danny built a community, and he was really a key node in, in, in the community. And in fact, you can actually say Danny was LinkedIn. And <laughs> what did that mean? Well, people came to MIT, and you connected. Uh, there were international students that were, that were here. I was actually quite amazed that you could be in a group with, with people from India, China, all over the place. And, and Danny said something to me, which, which I, I really took to heart. He said, to be an international student and come to the US for your studies meant you were really somebody special and you should be welcomed fully by the, by the American students. And I took that to heart and I still do that to this day. Um, it's enriched me by learning a lot about their cultures and hopefully I didn't inadvertently give them some poor habits and, and I still have to apologize to poor Rune who I think I hooked on a habit of drinking Diet Coke nonstop in the, in the lab. Uh, there were global visitors coming through, uh, either long term or just passing through for a tour. Um, one of the ones which, which Mike and I got a kick out of was Peter Stadler. We couldn't find a picture of him online. And uh, Peter uh, was from Bayer, a very high level executive at Bayer, was, came to MIT for some training as he was switching positions. And interestingly enough, when Mike and I went to Germany on our honeymoon, we got there after a long flight turned on the TV and who is being interviewed on national television but Peter Stadler. And then the last part of this is that um, BPEC uh, really had a lot of future employers come by, one of whom was Barry Buckland. He hired a bunch of us into Merck. Um, Matt mentioned a bunch of people went to Genentech and other, other companies. Uh, it, it was really fantastic to have these opportunities to connect with people. Danny was really present. Um, he was traveling. There was a lot of other things he was doing. He wasn't always at uh, MIT, but he felt like he was accessible, particularly when uh, you were in the lab already sleeping at the lab because you didn't want to miss that data, and he would come through on Saturday at 6 a.m. Um, he made you feel like you, can do, you could do it, you could make it happen, but he didn't actually say that, and it's, it's that confidence that, that, that really helped me a, a great deal. Now this next part of the slide is, is Mike's part of the slide. And so I have to apologize to Matt, to John, to Steve, to Max. This is the Culture Club. Uh, so the Culture Club is this, uh, this is Boy George is I think what Matt's supposed to be. They did a hit song called Karma Chameleon in, in, in the 80s. And this Culture Club was really unique because at the same time there was secondary metabolite culture, fungal cultures being grown, E. coli, yeast, uh, mammalian cells, uh, human cells, just everything was being grown within these, in these laboratories. I really appreciated that because in my subsequent career I've, I've, had to, uh, I've gotten that experience with, with all those types of cultures as well as enzymes if, if Art's still interest, it, it, listening. And this culture club really grew exponentially. So it, it was one thing to have all this happening at MIT but, but Danny really worked to, to teach it outside of MIT. So he had a grant for a series of films on fermenter design and operation. Mike was the interviewer and Dan was the producer. And there was a scene at the end where, where there's steam coming out because sometimes when you steam a fermenter, you, there's a, there can be a lot of excess steam in the, in the olden days with the, the, the plants. And Danny just sort of came through the steam, kind of like the devil. <laughs> and that was in these. And then of course there was BPEC. And, BPEC was just incredible because it was one of the earliest examples of cross-disciplinary uh, research. 
the, the amazing uh, accomplishment of getting a bunch of very strong and accomplished professors at MIT to join together into one uh, engineering center, uh, it was probably not easy. And as was mentioned before, it went on uh, for several decades. So I'm going to stop here. I, I have to admit, I've been on a bunch of advisory boards for schools that were thinking of creating consortia. And uh, I said, gee, I have some experience with that. I was the technical coordinator for BPEC. And, and I would recommend two things if you're going to start such a consortium. First, have somebody like Danny Wong be the director of it, because he will do a fan that person will do a fantastic job, because they'll know everything and, and make sure that it runs ship shape. But secondly, hire someone like Ruth Ayers, who's really going to run the show for you. I don't know how many of you remember Ruth. That was Danny's assistant, and she ruled with an iron fist, right? I, I want to change tracks just a little bit. I, I, you know, we've talked a lot about his scientific accomplishments, but I think we also can't forget his generosity and his humanity. Dan was really an incredible person. Um, and whether that was connecting with people at conferences and banquets in, in very, you know, personable and personal ways, um, I have to admit it got to the point where I would hope Dan would not sit next to me at a conference when somebody was giving a paper because Dan had so many things to say, some of them about the paper, but most about other things when he <laughs> sat next to you at, at a conference. But really great at connecting. Um, Dan was also very giving. And Vicki, I don't know if you remember this, but when Beth and I... Uh, had announced our engagement and we're going to get married. Um, the Wongs had an extra cherry wood bookshelf that they no longer needed. And they gave us a call and said, can you come by and pick up the cherry wood bookshelf? And, and of course we were like, oh, great. And when we left Massachusetts for New Jersey, this was the only piece of furniture that we carried with us. <laughs> Um, it, really amazing, and our kids today, who are now 30 and 27, still call it Dr. Wong's bookshelf. Um, and and no, that no, don't do this. Don't do this one. Don't do this one. Oh, come on, we got to do this one. We got to do no, this no, one. Yeah, sure? we're going to do this one. No, okay. Good. Dan was candid. We all know that from the Beam seminars and such. But Dan was candid in a personal way as well, right? Dan always had self-improvement tips for you, or you know, critiques of you. And so I remember, and remember, it was the 80s. And if you were a woman, you were very tempted to get a perm. And there's Dr. Yunker with perm. And Dan came up to her and said, what did you do to your hair? That's the sort of candor Dan had for those who he kept in his heart there. And, and lastly, Dan was, was, was very open to learning about people. Uh, at, you know, when Beth and I got married, we, before we had children, we had dogs. We had two golden retrievers called Lewis and Clark. Uh, that's them as their little puppies. And Dan was really amused by the fact that their names were Lewis and Clark. And later on, when we had real kids, Dan never remembered our real kids' names, but he always remembered Lewis and Clark, uh, which was really great. Now, one of the reasons why I'm bringing all these things up, these make, these I hopefully represent Dan as the person that he was, at least our snapshot of it. But, you know, Dan made more than science. Dan made leaders for an industry. And whether it was in innovation or the practical science or the development, all of those things are really key for leadership and we all took that away. But the other piece that Dan left us was the fact that it's really important when you're leading a group of people to make that personal connection, to make sure that they knew you as a person, you knew them as a person. And that bit of leadership is something that has been no more important than it has been in the last year and a half when people have been working from home, and it's so important to keep connected with the people you work with. And I think this is a lesson that we all took away, and we all have been able to create that sense of leadership. Um, and I also wanted to point out, Dan let us get to know Vicki and Keith, and that was really great too, and again was part of his generosity and giving us his, himself. So we, that's Dan, the innovation, the practice, practical science, the LinkedIn, the generosity. I hope that we painted a picture for you that the impact um, is personal as well as professional. And I talked about the fact, let's see if we can do this, I talked about the fact that we all have different parts of the elephant, we're all feeling different things, but something occurred to me, other than the guy with the tusk there, that we all also have a shared experience. There are certain things that we share, 
uh, and that if you worked with or for Danny, you have as part of your soul, right? Just like the folks who are touching the elephant, they can feel the pulsing of the blood, the, the beating of the heart. And so there's one thing that I know that we will all carry away. Thank you, Dan. We have one more uh, uh, set of comments before we take a, a bit of a break and can, can share uh, amongst ourselves uh, outside. Uh, John Onans, uh, who, who also comes from this, uh, this, this, this same era uh, and has gone on as a, uh, a very accomplished leader uh, in, the, in the industry uh, as well. So I invite John to the uh, stage, always wondering worrying about what he might say, but that's John, <laughs> please. Thanks, Charlie, and it's uh, certainly a, a, an extreme privilege to uh, be able to speak at this symposium and, and uh, pay due tribute to Danny. Uh, and um, I think, you know, you'll probably hear from me a lot of, uh, you know, Similar themes in terms of the experiences, uh, you know, and, and things we take away from Danny, but um, really more from kind of the lessons I took uh, away from those experiences uh, in terms of um, really just how to, how to think about life, how to treat people, and so forth. Now, unlike the previous distinguished speakers, uh, you know, I came to MIT from University of Kansas, not from Caltech or Berkeley or Princeton. Um, so I was somewhat less prepared uh, for the rigors of MIT and that, you know, drink from a fire hose than, than some of the uh, other people. So, you know, Jono and uh, Paola, I know, you know, the feeling of that 26 out of 100 kind of a thing. Uh, and I will say that, you know, one time I was uh, over at Art Goldstein's house and uh, we were in his living room where he has a bookcase and I noticed his thesis up on the wall. And so I pulled it out and I started thumbing through it. And this is his master's thesis in chemical engineering. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's a master's thesis. That was last week's problem set. We only had a week to do that. What the heck? You know? <laughs> so um, it was hard. It was hard. Uh, you know, and suffice to say, uh, you know, I, at that time, I, I was frankly terrified of professors. Uh, it, was, it was really tough. Uh, you know, since then, I've learned that you know, if, if Greg Rutledge and uh, Crystal Prather can become, you know, department executives and, and chaired tenured faculty. They can't all be gods, right? But, but Danny's certainly, a, you know, he's he sufficed to be a god. Um, but and he was, you know, very gracious. I felt in in you know taking a student like myself into his lab. You know, much to my benefit, uh, I will say. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about how he was a straight shooter. Uh, a lot of people had different experiences. I guess my experience with uh, Danny was more of, uh, you know, the patient but very disappointed father, uh, you know, kind of thing. And your one-on-ones with him, you know, you'd present him with your data and he'd look at it, I got your shoes, you know, put on his glasses, look at it, take off those glasses, you know, where do I go with this guy? <laughs> but, um, you know, that was enough feedback, right? You knew you had disappointed. You knew you could do better, <laughs> and so you did. Um, you know, he didn't berate you, he didn't ream you out, uh, you know, but you, you knew that, you know, do your best uh, and really commit yourself with something that, you know, uh, you know, Danny really did. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time remembering any time where, uh, you know, I actively saw him, you know, being mean to somebody, whether it was, you know, at MIT, at the Beam Seminars, myself, or, you know, at conferences or anything. And, uh, you know, I really took away that lesson. Uh, you'll catch more uh, flies with honey than vinegar. Uh, and I've tried to practice that throughout my, you know, career in industry. So uh, I've always told my staff, uh, you know, biotech is an extremely small world. We all know each other. Don't piss anybody off. Now, having said that, um, Danny did one time call me an effing a-hole. And I don't remember whether that was after I inserted a line item into the BPEC proposal to NSF for a 200-gallon redwood hot tub. 
or whether that was after his 50th birthday uh, and I did a sketch imitating him, uh, much to his chagrin. I'm sure I deserved it regardless of which one it was. <laughs> you know, Danny's, uh, you know, commitment uh, was, you know, very telling. I mean, he, he viewed uh, biochemical engineering as a calling. Uh, you know, he got to the lab at 5 a.m., right? He left at 5 p.m. to go play tennis. Um, this was a phase, you know, when we knew him, the students of his career. He was in his 50s, right? He, he had tenure, you know. He had glorious success. Uh, you know, he st helped start companies like Biogen. That had made him already very successful, right? But this was really a calling. He did this because he loved it, right? And, uh, you know, I think that's something that I really took away uh, from and, and tried to apply to my career. You know, treat this as a vocation that you is something that you really, really are passionate about. It's not a, you know, it's not something just a means to an end so you can go play. Um, you know, we've we've heard though that uh, you know Danny did balance that uh, work and life, and we've heard that from John O. You know, you could see he would go out and play tennis, you know, with his students or with other faculty members and such at five o'clock. Um, so you know, make time, but really work hard and play hard. Uh, and that you know, in the end of the day, you know, your accomplishments uh, and what you do for your team members, your patients, or your customers is what's going to really give you a satisfying career uh, and and leave you fulfilled. So that's a lesson I took away. Um, the other lesson I took away from that five to five schedule and those early interactions of, of extreme disappointment was that if you wanted the one-on-ones to go very well, what you did was you scheduled your one-on-ones in the late afternoon after his nap, when he's a little bit groggy waking up, and when he wanted to get out the door to play tennis, right? And that's when things went very rapidly and well for you. So uh, that's another lesson I learned, manage upwards. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the interesting thing is, is that I, the next thing I want to talk about is really uh, about Danny and community. And, of course, a lot of people have, have started to, you know, talk about that today. And, uh, you know, I think even after you left MIT, Danny didn't leave you, right? You saw him everywhere. Uh, and uh, I found it very interesting as I would go through my career, you know, you'd be talking to a colleague and, you know, you talk would turn to grad school and, and people would make comments like, oh, yeah, I haven't talked to my advisor in 10 years. And I'm thinking, you know, man, I saw, you know, my advisor, Danny, you know, six months ago, and I saw your advisor last year, right? <laughs> you know, but he was, he was always everywhere. Uh, he was always everywhere. And he made time for people, right? Even in the midst of a super busy, you know, MIT professorship trying to helm this, you know, BPEC monstrosity, have a lab with 20 plus grad students. He made time for people, right? And gave, you know, incredible uh, amounts of, of great advice, whether it's technical or philosophical uh, to me, uh, you know, when uh, I was at Merck. And, uh, you, know, you know, if anything, I think that's one of the Danny's hugest accomplishments is, is giving back to that community, right? Um, and, you know, I think uh, I'm pleased, uh, but very, I will say very unsurprised to say that, you know, of all the speakers this afternoon, uh, I've either worked with or have maintained friendships for over 30 years with everyone except Dr. Araba, which I, who I somehow escaped my orbit. I don't know why. Probably good for you. But, um, you know, uh, you know, I think that says volumes just about the tight-knit communities uh, that, that he's fostered. Uh, and, you know, we've heard about Danny's, uh, you know, uh, fantastic, uh, you know, Chinese dinners at conferences and, uh, you know, he would attend these religiously and that's where you'd have a major uh, point of engagement with him. And, of course, we've heard about how we would always seek out, you know, the best Chinese restaurants, right, uh, to, to feed people on and uh, take a, you know, he'd always host a gaggle of his students, uh, you know, along with, right. But uh, I think the interesting thing about Dan was that, you know, it wasn't just students. They, he would bring in outsiders, uh, you know, to come along and tag along to, and so he built that community. It wasn't solely about MIT. It was, it was about that vocation uh, that he built around and um, was just very generous, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that way. And those, you know, social rituals of going out to Chinese dinners and then playing poker back in his hotel room, uh, that really knitted that community together and kept it together and, and taught us all the lesson to, you know, really make sure that we take care of our own and build our own communities and expand them as well. Um, 
You know, uh, one of the things I would say is, uh, you know, uh, Dan was sufficiently gracious that, you know, he would even do things like one time he, uh, he consulted for us at Merck on his birthday, right? Went out on his birthday. And if you know Dan, uh, you know, you know Danny did not like celebrating his birthday, right? Uh, he doesn't like it even more so if you present him with a birthday cake and you have a very large group of people singing him the happy birthday song in Chinese with, lyric, with the uh, <coughs> words translated uh, into Chinese by Steve Lee. Uh, so uh, the lesson I learned there is don't poke the bear. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, uh, you know, on the theme of expanding communities, uh, you know, and, and Danny's magnanimity, um, I'd, I'd like to say a couple of words about uh, Manuel Carondo, and I don't know how many people in the audience here know Manuel, but um, uh, Manuel is basically, he's the godfather of modern biotechnology in Portugal, right? He's kind of a mini Danny, if you will. Uh, and I first met him when he was on a sabbatical uh, with Danny, and, and Danny assigned him to work with me or vice versa, I'm not sure which. Uh, and unfortunately, Manuel cannot be here because of the travel ban on Europeans, uh, which is, is very sad. I know he would dearly love to be here with all of us. Um, and I wanted to basically convey you know, his appreciation uh, for all of the support that Danny gave to him. Uh, Danny devoted significant time uh, to go to B uh, IBET, which is an institute that Manuel was trying to establish and really take Portugal from what was really you know, just you know, food science, fermentation-based starter cultures and, and such, and take it into the modern era of, you know, protein-based biotechnology. Uh, you know, Danny didn't have to do this. Uh, at that time, Portugal was a poor, backwards country, had no biotech industry, right? But the help he gave, I bet, the introductions he gave to Manuel, the tough love and, and hard advice he gave Manuel, Paid off in spades. I bet is now, uh, you know, a very significant biotech research institute in Europe and across the world, uh, and its current CEO, Paula Alvish, uh, uh, just was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's an example of where, you know, Danny really expanded the community way beyond MIT and and gave back, even when he was very busy and didn't have to. And of course he did that repeatedly in China and Singapore and also other venues as well. So I took away from that is to, you know, make sure to expand my, my own uh, uh, orbit and to try to give back as much as I can. Late in my career, uh, I made the move back to Boston to be part of the small biotech world and get away from big pharma slavery, Mike. Um, and uh, this afforded me the opportunity to actually, uh, you know, see Danny again, uh, because after he'd had a stroke, he really kind of uh, stayed close to home and, and fell off of the conference circuits and so forth. And you know, in that phase, uh, I have to say, you know, it, it was it was very fun uh, to catch up with Danny, uh, to have lunches with him, uh, and to you know reminisce about the old days, uh, catch up on various people. I mean, he was still at his computer writing grants when he was 80, right? He still had ideas and wanted to do stuff, right? And I think you've, you've heard about this, you know, always, always take on a challenge, always look at this as a vocation. And that's, that was just Danny, right? But um, one of the interesting things is, you know, you, we go, I go to this lunch, you know, and uh, he had his finger on the pulse, right? He knew Every scientific event that had come out of my company, you know, press releases, he knew that the stock was doing, uh, you know, and he knew that about uh, everybody else's companies too. I remember one lunch he was mad at Nubar uh, because Nubar wouldn't give him an early investment in Brian Bain's company, Midori Health, <laughs> and Danny wanted in on it. He thought, you know, he wanted to invest in his student Brian. Uh, so, he, you know, he, he just, he kept tabs on everybody, all of you guys. He knew what you were doing. Um, and it was really, uh, it was just really impressive. He also kept up his love of poker. Uh, I think you saw that recent uh, picture from, uh, from Matt of the West Coast version of the East Coast poker game uh, that we had with Danny, uh, with Parrish Gallagher and, and John O and, and Greg Nyberg and, and Keith, uh, his son. Uh, suffice to say, Danny uh, took us to the cleaners too. <laughs> So, um, you know, he, uh, he, he maintained that love, uh, you know, and uh, he always stayed sharp and engaged. And I think, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, with that building of community and maintenance of that, you know, he, he also taught me a lesson that it may pay off tangibly in the end if you do this, right? So um, to close, I think I'd just like to basically say that, you know, uh, I lost a genuine and caring man who I consider my academic father, a second father, who shaped a generation, shaped an industry, and we're not going to see his like again very soon. So um, from his lessons, I'll try to focus on my calling, keeping communities together, poking bears, and calling it like it is. And it may be even pay off tangibly in the end. So I look forward to having a round to pass the buck with you guys sometime later tonight and lots of good Chinese food. So thanks. Well, it's been incredible to hear the story so far, and we've been in the 80s realm. Um, before we break, uh, I just wanted to mention some of the key characteristics that we've been hearing about, which includes Danny's innovation and his drive for new ideas, which I think is incredibly exciting, uh, and his huge generosity and the way that he championed his students. And I have to say that my own experience as uh, an undergraduate and as a, a, a young faculty member are very similar. Uh, Danny was my mentor, as I mentioned earlier, and when I first began to meet with him, my work at that time was on polymer self-assembly, and I remember being scared. He was asking me really hard questions, like, what are you gonna do with that? And <laughs> can you get a patent on it? And uh, can it be translated to something that does something? And I remember the first couple of times I met with him coming back and going, oh my God, you know, I, I don't know if I can have Danny understand what I'm doing, and I'm not sure if it's going to be any good. But what he did was he drove me to think about the questions I needed to ask about my own work, and he also drove me to articulate the value of it. And uh, as we moved along, he actually became my greatest champion. And I found out about that uh, after tenure, a few years later, when a couple of my colleagues said, you just, if you could have seen Danny present your work to the senior faculty, he has to be the absolute biggest advocate and fan of you. And I, I, I was just, you know, overwhelmed by the fact that he would do this. I was not at that time in the bio field. I later moved into it. Um, and uh, believe in me. And I think that's something that I've heard from everyone in this room, that Danny reaches out to people, that he cares about them, he takes his students under his wing, he takes his mentees under his wing, and he makes sure that they are okay. He makes sure that they go out into the world prepared and equipped, and he continues to make, remain in their lives um, and continues to make those connections. So I think we've had a wonderful uh, set of stories already, and we're going to hear more, so I want you to all have a chance to take a little break, and then we're going to enter the 90s and beyond. Uh, so please come back in about 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>